Last month, we broke the news that Lockheed Martin's legendary Skunk Works team was directly involved in the development of a full-sized mock-up of the hypersonic Dark Star aircraft featured in Top Gun Maverick. But after digging a bit deeper into this story, I found some evidence that suggests that Dark Star may not just be movie magic, and in fact, there may already be a program aimed at fielding a very similar platform. In other words, forget hypersonic missiles. Let's talk hypersonic aircraft. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Right off the bat, I want you guys to know that this video will be a bit different than usual. In the first half, I'm going to give you the same cold hard facts I usually do, but in the second half, I get a little whimsical and I start drawing some conclusions that I can't completely substantiate. I'll make it clear when I'm doing that, but I want you to know up front, because it seems like there could be a hypersonic aircraft screaming its way towards service in the near future, but I can't confirm it. So, if that's not really for you, I understand, and let me know if you don't want me to do this sort of stuff again. For those of you who may not be familiar, hypersonic is a term used to refer to platforms that can travel at speeds in excess of Mach 5, or around 3,838 miles per hour. By combining maneuverability with this degree of speed, modern hypersonic missiles are considered impossible to intercept using current air defense systems. And to be honest, that suggests hypersonic aircraft would be just as tough to bring down. Which brings us to Dark Star, the fictional Mach 10 aircraft featured in Top Gun Maverick. The truth is, there seems to be much more to this story than a cool-looking imaginary airplane. Dark Star may not be as fictional as you think. In fact, Lockheed Martin has been working on just such an aircraft for a long time now, and although they've purged their website of any mention of it, I managed to dig up some interesting bits of evidence. But before we dive into that, let's go over Dark Star itself. Top Gun Maverick was a sequel some 36 years in the making, but in a way, Dark Star is a long-awaited sequel in itself. As we discussed when Top Gun's toy line first dropped on Sandbox News, Dark Star bears a striking resemblance to previous renders from Lockheed Martin of their highly anticipated follow-up to the SR-71 Blackbird, known simply as the SR-72. Of course, back in 2020 when I wrote that story, I had no idea Lockheed Martin was involved. I just happened to get it right. Now, to be clear, the Dark Star we saw in the movie is just as fictional as the Top Gun universe itself, but there are some very strong parallels between the Dark Star and an ongoing program within the Air Force Research Laboratory known as Mayhem. And to make things even more interesting, Mayhem seems to have Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works involved. Now, I want to be clear that a lot of what you'll hear from here forward is supposition based on evidence, because although the Air Force Research Laboratory has said that Lockheed Skunk Works is one of only three firms they believe could develop such a platform, to date there has been no official announcement that the Skunk Works is leading Mayhem. But I have a feeling that by the end of this video, you'll agree that they probably have the inside track, if nothing else. The story behind Mayhem is intrinsically tied to the ongoing hypersonic arms race, because hidden within the long list of hypersonic weapons programs currently drawing funds from Pentagon coffers, right now there are more than 70 of them, the Air Force Research Laboratory's Mayhem program might seem like just another one of those efforts. But a closer look at the language used in the Air Force's contracting documents suggests that Mayhem isn't a missile program at all. Instead, it seems to be aimed at developing the holy grail of hypersonic flight, a dual-cycle scramjet propulsion system capable of taking off and landing just like any other aircraft while achieving hypersonic speeds mid-flight. It's also supposed to carry larger payloads for longer distances than what the contracts refer to as existing scramjet systems, though it doesn't specify which systems it's referring to. Now, as some of you watching already know, scramjets, or supersonic combustion ramjets, aren't exactly new technology. They've been under testing for decades, but to date, no nation has ever managed to field an operational scramjet in a missile, let alone an aircraft. 
Unlike traditional jet engines, which use spinning fan blades for compression, scramjets use the immense force of air flowing into their jet inlets at supersonic and higher speeds to compress the air itself. That air is then mixed with fuel and detonated out the back for propulsion, just like any other jet engine. According to Lockheed Martin, their dual-cycle scramjets could feasibly propel an aircraft to a sustained speed of Mach 6, or a bit better than 4,600 miles per hour. NASA thinks scramjet technology itself could probably reach speeds higher than Mach 15. But there's always a but, and in the case of scramjets, it's that they need to be moving at very high speeds in order to create that compression, so they just don't operate well at the lower speeds required for regular things like takeoff and landing. And as a result, even the most advanced scramjets in testing today are carried aloft by an aircraft and then launched using rockets before the scramjet can come online. And that's where the Air Force Research Laboratory's MAYHEM program comes in, because although it's regularly referred to as a missile program, a closer look at the issued requests for information suggests that it's more likely aiming at fielding an uncrewed, reusable hypersonic drone. Let me walk you through that line of thinking. When Mayhem was announced in August of 2020, its formal name was the Expendable Hypersonic Multi-Mission Air Breathing Demonstrator. But just last year, it was renamed to the Hypersonic Multi-Mission ISR and Strike platform. And the effort has also been referred to in other documents as a multi-mission cruiser. This really suggests that we're not just talking about a missile that you fire at a target and forget about. The removal of the word expendable, in conjunction with that multi-mission moniker, both suggest that Mayhem aims to field a reusable, autonomous platform that leverages what will likely be the world's first dual-mode or turbine-based combined cycle hypersonic propulsion system. Mayhem is often referred to as a hypersonic missile program, but the documents the Air Force released about it late last year call for a platform that can carry at least three different types of payloads for two very different mission sets. The first mission set are strike operations, and it calls for a platform that can carry either an area effect payload or a large unitary payload, both obviously forms of ordnance. The second mission set is ISR, or Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance. That is, of course, the same mission set the SR-71 once filled for the United States. Now, I want to be clear that this document does not specifically cite a dual-mode scramjet propulsion system, nor does it call what Mayhem is producing anything other than a vehicle, which could potentially be a missile. But I'm going to read you the technical description the Air Force provided, and then I'll tell you why I drew these conclusions. Here's what the Air Force says. The Mayhem program is focused on delivering a larger class air-breathing hypersonic system capable of executing multiple missions with standardized payload interface, providing a significant technological advancement and future capability. This system goal is to carry payloads five times the mass and double the range of current technology capability systems. All right, let's take a step back and go over a few of those points. It says the Mayhem program is focused on delivering a larger class air-breathing hypersonic system. An air-breathing hypersonic system is either a ramjet or a scramjet. It goes on to say this system needs to be capable of executing multiple missions, which you could argue might mean a missile that could fulfill multiple mission roles, or you could argue that means an aircraft that could fly multiple missions with a standardized payload interface. Now let's combine that understanding with the fact that this platform needs to be able to execute both strike and reconnaissance operations, and it states in this ROI that it needs to provide a significant technological advancement and future capability. Just another scramjet-powered missile wouldn't really do that, but a dual-cycle scramjet that incorporates a jet engine to allow the aircraft to take off and land like any normal platform, while still achieving hypersonic speeds during the mid-course of its flight, actually would. Okay, by now you're probably asking, what is a dual-cycle or multi-mode scramjet, and why is it a big deal? 
Put simply, it's really just a regular jet engine combined with a scramjet system all in one platform. And what that would allow for is an aircraft that could use the traditional jet engine to take off and accelerate all the way up to around Mach 3, where scramjets work efficiently. From there, the scramjet would carry the aircraft all the way past Mach 5 and beyond. But when it came time to land, the scramjet would turn things back over to the jet turbine that could operate at lower speeds to allow the aircraft to land like any other jet. As a result, you end up with a reusable hypersonic platform, and that's a really big deal, because scramjets aren't cheap, and it's not very efficient to embed them in your target with a warhead strapped to the front. And when I say not cheap, I mean it. A recent DoD assessment of the hypersonic missiles the U.S. has in development estimates that each missile is going to cost somewhere between $84 and $106 million. That means one hypersonic missile will cost more than an F-35A. So wouldn't it make more sense to develop a reusable hypersonic platform that could carry regular good old-fashioned ordnance into the fight, but still deliver the same survivability of a hypersonic system? And that's where we get to the SR-72. You see, late last week, Lockheed Martin released a bunch of new pictures and video and statements about the Dark Star aircraft they developed for Top Gun Maverick. But littered throughout their statements were little hints that Dark Star may not be all Hollywood magic, and there may be some reality behind what we're seeing on the screen. In fact, I'll go ahead and just quote them right here. With the Skunk Works expertise in developing the fastest known aircraft, combined with a passion and energy for defining the future of aerospace, Dark Star's capabilities could be more than mere fiction. They could be reality. But hear me out, there's more than just some PR copy to go through. Because if you pour over the Lockheed Martin website dating back to around 2013, using the Wayback Machine or another internet archive, you can find all kinds of interesting stuff about the SR-72 and a pretty interesting timeline. And if you line that timeline up with other news stories from the same period of time, it gets even more interesting. I'm going to run through this quickly, but I go through it in more depth in the full write-up on Sandbox News. Word first started to reach the media about Lockheed wanting to develop an SR-72 all the way back in 2007. And by 2015, they were so open about it that Popular Science did a cover story about it, and Lockheed Martin had a webpage devoted to the SR-72 on their website. By 2017, Aviation Week was reporting people spotting SR-72 technology demonstrators flying over Palmdale, California. Palmdale is where Skunk Works is located. And from here on out, the timeline moves faster and gets weirder. In January of 2018, Jack O'Banion, one of Lockheed Martin's vice presidents, spoke at the SciTech Forum held by the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And during the event, he had an artist's rendering of the SR-72 projected on the screen behind him as he discussed it as though it was a real aircraft that already existed. I'll quote him here. Without the digital transformation, the aircraft you see there could not have been made. We couldn't have made the engine itself. It would have melted down into slag if we tried to produce it five years ago. But now we can digitally print that engine with an incredibly sophisticated cooling system integral into the material of the engine itself and have that engine survive for multiple firings for routine operation. If that didn't catch your interest, Bloomberg pressed him about these statements and he said, and again I quote, the aircraft is also agile at hypersonic speeds with reliable engine starts. It's worth noting that if you're going through the Wayback Machine, the SR-72's webpage was up throughout all of this. But in March of that year, just two months later, Russian President Vladimir Putin gave a speech where he announced the world's first operational hypersonic missiles. And the world sort of freaked out about it. And while going through archives of Lockheed Martin's website, they removed the SR-72 page and any other mention of the platform immediately after Putin's speech. So what was it that Lockheed Martin took down immediately after Vladimir Putin kicked off what many have come to see as a hypersonic arms race? Well, fortunately, it's still available via the Wayback Machine, and I can read it to you. A hypersonic plane does not have to be an expensive, distant possibility. In fact, 
An SR-72 could be operational by 2030. For the past several years, Lockheed Martin Skunk Works has been working with Aerojet Rocketdyne to develop a method to integrate an off-the-shelf turbine with a supersonic combustion ramjet air-breathing jet engine to power the aircraft from a standstill to Mach 6. Removing this immediately after Putin's speech may suggest that Lockheed Martin suddenly got some direct interest from the DoD in pushing this program back into the classified side of the House. And to further substantiate that, almost immediately after they took down that webpage, Lockheed Martin began investing heavily in expanding that Palmdale facility people had seen SR-72 tech demonstrators flying out of. I'll quote Lockheed Martin spokeswoman Melissa Dalton about that facility in Palmdale. Classified work will be done in the facility. While I can't share any details about what specifically we'll be working on there, it will follow in the Skunk Works tradition of innovative solutions to urgent national needs. Before long, the Air Force Research Laboratory would announce the Mayhem Initiative, which states very similar needs to what the SR-72 already claimed to deliver. Now, you guys know me. I don't deal in conspiracy theories or tinfoil hat stuff, but if you've got some tinfoil laying around, let's strap it on just for a minute. Because it sort of seems like right after Vladimir Putin made the whole world panic about hypersonic missiles, the DoD decided it was time to ramp up the SR-72 program. And not long after, it funneled money into it from one of the 70 or more hypersonic missile programs currently drawing funding from Pentagon coffers. If you're trying to hide a hypersonic aircraft, the best place to do it would be in a big pile of hypersonic missiles. But then Top Gun Maverick came out with the Dark Star, and Lockheed Martin was happy to lean into the idea that the stuff you saw the Dark Star do just may be possible. And if you ask me, that seems like a bit of a smile and a wink. There may be a big announcement on the horizon, or maybe I'm off base here. It happens. But in any case, that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of this video and you like this kind of more conspiracy-oriented stuff, let me know and I'll do more of it. If this wasn't really for you, let me know that too and I'll bear that in mind next time. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.